Okay, folks, welcome. Um, I didn't know if anyone was going to be interested in this. It's kind of nice to see a robust crowd. Uh, when we do public events, uh, we always begin with a little safety briefing. I am your responsible safety officer. This is the one event I'm not worried about. Because if anything, if a, a terrorist is so stupid as to try to take on this bunch, they're not going to live long. But I do want to say, if we do have an episode, you're going to take instructions from me. We've got exits right here on this side. We go out. We're going to go down the uh, stairway, which is right outside here. Outside, we're going to meet across the street at the Beacon Hotel, and I'll pay for drinks for everybody, OK? So, but, but do pay attention to me. If I have to tell you to do something, do it. OK. Um, I'm very grateful that we can get together with you today, and very grateful to have these leaders with us. Special thanks to the U.S. Navy Institute. And, Jim, thank you for your leadership here. We love partnering with you. Uh, this is going to be quite an interesting session. Now, I remember um, the days when the Navy and the Marine Corps loved each other like brothers, Cain and Abel, right? <laughs> you know, and each was going to try to kill the other to get his soup for the night. Uh, that's changed. Uh, that's changed because we now have truly visionary leadership that is looking forward and saying, you know, we don't have enough resources as a country to do it dumb, so we're going to have to be smart. And being smart is finding the strengths in each other and finding ways to make those strengths come together. And that's what you're going to hear today. I deeply admire these gentlemen because they have been leading in a very important way to bring services together. You know, there are, I, I say this, there are two forms of athletic competition where you win by backing up. One is tug of war, and the other is rowing, competitive rowing. Now, everybody below these guys plays tug of war every day, right? And they're the ones that are trying to get everybody facing in the boat the same direction, the oars synchronized so that they can win. And it's that kind of leadership the country needs right now. We're very grateful to have them here. And before I turn it over to Admiral Stavridis, let me just say welcome to the Secretary of Navy, John Warner. We're delighted to have you here, Senator. Now, my very dear friend, Jim Stavridis, he is, uh, you know, never content to be just a, a military officer. He also decided to be a scholar and wrote books while I'm trying to get out a weekly memo. <laughs> I don't know how the hell that worked. Uh, and Jim is now heading up the Fletcher School and just doing terrific things. He, and so I'm going to turn to Jim, and Jim's going to lead this conversation. And thanks to all of you. We look forward to hearing this presentation. Thank you very much. John, thank you. Well, I just uh, return the compliment. I don't think there's anybody in Washington, Dr. Hamry, who has a deeper knowledge or more of the finger feel for the Department of Defense. So thank you for your time in the building as well. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Um, first of all, thank you all for turning out. This is uh, absolutely an incredible uh, turnout, and it, it makes sense because this is an extremely important document. Um, in the, uh, the so-called green room, and of course these are three citizens of the green room here. Um, beforehand, I heard the Commandant of the Marine Corps, my very good friend Joe Dunford, fellow Fletcher graduate, by the way. Um, Joe was quoting Jackie Fisher. He said, um, now that the money's run out, it's time to think. And I think there is something to that in this uh, strategy. And, uh, so there are motivations for why now? Why are we rolling out this strategy now? Part of it is resources. But I think it would be fascinating to hear from each of the three service chiefs about why now. Um, if we look at the long throw of maritime strategies, go back to the Cold War, uh, of course, the maritime strategy, uh, pretty clearly delineated a world that no longer exists. Um, we had the fall of the wall, the end of the Cold War, dot, 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 from the sea. Takes us, if you will, into the littoral. And then, more recently, 2007, the cooperative strategy, uh, of which this one is a revision, mm -hmm. but appears to me in many ways to be quite a new document. So 
Hopefully we'll tease out some of those things. What I thought I would do is ask each of the three service chiefs kind of an opening question about why now from their service perspectives, and then give each of them a moment to simply talk about um, <coughs> their particular services piece of this strategy. And then we'll open it up to questions, and I know there are a lot. So with that, if I can start with uh, my very good friend, John Greener, our sure. Chief of Naval Operations. Sir, why now? What why makes not? sense? Why not? <laughs> so there you go. Well, uh, honestly, why literally now in the nearer term? Because we had our thoughts kind of pulled together over a year ago. I wanted to be sure that my two colleagues here who uh, and we knew that changeover was going to take place. We're fully on board, and I didn't try to clobber something, because this is a sea service document right off the bat, that I didn't try to clobber that, so I wanted to be sure that they were fully on board and had the opportunity to, to consume it. But why now, generally speaking, well, where were we in 2007? Mm -hmm. We still had the John F. Kennedy uh, conventional carrier, and we're thinking you know, we have one here coming under construction soon. We still had the Kitty Hawk in the Western Pacific. Yeah. The Enterprise was yeah. nowhere near decommissioned. Cyber wasn't a word yet. We were ramping up in Iraq, yeah. and violence we're still thinking is coming up mm -hmm. in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. We never heard of ISIS, ISIL, Boko Haram. Mm -hmm. uh, the Western Pacific was still in a different place. Mm -hmm. So you get my point. It's a very, very yeah. different world. And a lot of our missions were evolving during that time. So I felt it was time to, in my view, redefine or define sea power as I see it as we see it, looking now and out into the future. Uh, I felt it was important, and we uh, all agreed in the group that we worked, to say, what are we really about, and put that foundation in its presence, uh, to be out there and about, and to lay down uh, and to uh, explore and lay down our functions and be comfortable with them. Deterrence, power projection, mm -hmm. sea control, and maritime security. And what we felt very, very much in unison was all domain access. And that, to me, that's taking air-sea battle mm -hmm. and what we now call the joint concept for access and maneuver in the uh, global commons. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, that acronym. I didn't even get the acronym. <laughs> so, to, to lay that in and, and codify right. what we're doing. Wonderful. Well, let me turn it to the Commandant of the Marine Corps. How does this moment make sense for the Corps, Joe? Yeah, I think in addition to what the CNO said, I mean, there's really, there's really three factors. One is the complexity of the security environment that he spoke about. And with that has come extraordinarily increased demand uh, by the combatant commanders. Mm -hmm. and demand we can't meet if we, do it, if, if we do business the way we've historically been doing it. So I think what this document now does <laughs> is drive us to a degree of integration that frankly is the next level from, yeah. from where we've been. And, uh, and that's why I made the comment in the green room that you, that you mentioned is it's time to think because we cannot actually buy our way out of the security problems that we have right now. Right. Uh, if you take the complexity of the security environment, the increased demand in the context of a fiscally constrained environment uh, with, with relatively fixed resources, uh, meeting that demand is going to require us to do things differently. And, and that's why, uh, in addition to Sino's process comments and, and his comments about the war fighting aspect of it, I think that's why it makes sense for us to do it right now. And, and that's why, from a Marine Corps perspective, we're excited about it, because mm -hmm. I do think there are things that we can do uh, better than we've been doing in the past. Uh, there's modifications that we can make to the way we're, do we're doing business that better take advantage of the resources we're going to have. And frankly, this document also might inform the prioritization and allocation of resources in a different way in the coming years that would get us to build a force that's more capable and more relevant to, our, to the security challenges we confront. Yeah, no, that's a wonderful point. I uh, happened to have uh, breakfast this morning with Brent Scowcroft, one of the great strategists, I think, of our times. And he said something that stuck with me, which is we were talking about in today's world, does strategy even make sense because it's become such a tactical sure. world? And he said, well, if all you do is crisis management, all you're going to get is more crisis. Right. That's a pretty powerful point. Yeah. Commandant, let me turn to you, sir, and say from the perspective of our Coast Guard, um, how does this moment feel for you in terms of the right time? Thank you, Jim. Uh, to follow on the biblical Cain and Abel <laughs> reference, I'm David trying to take down a Goliath. <laughs> so, uh, we've had a convergence of Goliath since 2007. Uh, one is the Arctic. It's an ocean, but it's become a much more open ocean. Uh, we've seen military gestures by Russia in the Arctic, but really what are the biggest concerns in the Arctic? Someone's going to fall in it or oil spills in it, and it affects the way of life up in the Arctic domain. So. 
I look at the Arctic, uh, the nation right now, we produce more oil than we import, and by 2020, we will be a net export nation. We produce the most oil and gas in the world. The Panama Canal opens, it's gonna change sea lines of communication, but the Coast Guard is a regulatory agency in guaranteeing the safety and security of that maritime transportation mm -hmm. system. Uh, we have a vital part there as well. Uh, Intel now drives most of our operations. We no longer go out and do random patrols, and we have awareness through whole of government on about 90% of the drug flow destined to the United States. On the best of days, I can probably put planes and ships on about 20% of that flow. <coughs> At a point in time where the Western Hemisphere is besieged by organized crime, eight of, out of 10 of the most violent nations are here, as we look at this cooperative strategy, the Navy has to rebalance. When you look at the threats across the world, and so it's imperative that the Coast Guard provides some of that filler, if you will, to stay focused and maintain the momentum that we have in the Western Hemisphere. Perfect. Um, well, let me kind of spin the order and ask each of you to just say a word about, as you read the strategy and you think about your service, um, it's one thing to have a strategy, now you've got to execute it. So. What are the keys for execution uh, as you look at the strategy going forward? Can I ask you to go right back again? We'll just walk it back this way. So I'll go way back in time. 1790, yeah. Alexander Hamilton chartered a fleet of 10 revenue cutters. Right. And I'm sure the right number back then would have been about 20. Uh, <laughs> but we may do with 10. Uh, but we've always been very platform-centric. Yeah. Give me a budget, and then I'll figure out what to do with it. Uh, you really need to have strategy drive your budgetary process. Sure. Uh, this strategy comports very well. The Coast Guard has several series of strategies. We have an Arctic strategy that aligns with a national strategy for the Arctic region. I just released a Western Hemisphere strategy that aligns with our department strategy for southern borders, and we now have a national strategy for Central America. Uh, within the next month, I will then release a all domain, a cyber strategy, uh, because the Coast Guard operates in three domains, mm -hmm. .mil, .gov, and then .com, and our relationship with the mm -hmm. maritime industry. So this really comes at a very opportune time for us to align our strategies with a higher level, and especially mm -hmm. with among the three sea services. That's an interesting way to approach it. So you're creating, and already have, if you will, some sub-strategies, both regional and functional. Interesting approach. Commandant, what say you? What's you know, the execution I think the, plan? The, uh, well, the strategy outlines for, for the Marine Corps, uh, which should be no surprise to anybody follow, that follows the Marine Corps. One, uh, we should be forward deployed, forward engaged, and able to respond to crisis. And, and secondly, we should be part of what the CNO has <coughs> described as all-domain access. Uh, we provide a forceful entry capability that is a, is a key piece of of all domain access. And so the next step is, uh, which we're actually are in the midst of anyway, is reviewing the capabilities that we have to support those. And, and as I mentioned uh, today, if you uh, met the combatant commander's requirements, you'd need something over 50 ships. Well, we don't have 50 ships. So uh, we're gonna have 33 amphibious ships. Uh, that's the fiscally constrained requirement. And so the first step is to take a look and say, look, we have a requirement to be forward deployed, forward engaged. We have a re requirement to respond to crises. We have a fixed inventory of amphibious ships. So what else can we do to put Marines at sea, mm -hmm. to put Marines and sailors at sea, to be able to respond to crises in a timely manner? And, and to put that in some perspective, I use two models. There's really two models of crisis response. There's the model of conducting evacuation operations this past year in the Sudan and Libya and Yemen where you're on the front page uh, above the fold for about 24 hours, mm -hmm. and then that incident, you, you've moved on. Or there's the crisis response model of Benghazi, which never goes away. And of course, in one case, you respond within hours. In other cases, you respond within days. And the American people, I think, have an expectation that it's the former, not the latter, uh, that the Marines and sailors will be able to do. So in terms of where we go next, I think one of the more important things we do is we take a look at how do we fill that gap that we currently have. We are doing some of that shore-based. That, of course, is, is suboptimal mm -hmm. from my perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, the one thing you have when you have naval forces is you have a piece of U.S. sovereignty out there. You don't have to ask permission to do things. You can do whatever the nation needs you to do. And so, you know, although we have special purpose MAGTACs that are currently filling that gap, I think there's other things we can do uh, to fill that gap, and the strategy uh, outlines that. From a, from a war fighting perspective, uh, we have some capability gaps uh, inside, the, inside the organization right now. 
And, I, and frankly, uh, that's something that we've been looking at over the last couple of years, and what the document now does is just provide even more clear focus on the need to move forward with those, again, to make sure that we can do all the things we need to be able to do across the range of military operations, which really runs from that day-to-day -day engagement that the document lays out, and then supporting the all-domain access, which in my mind, a subset of that, an important subset of that, is the nation's force military capability from the sea, and we are the only force yeah. military capability from the sea the nation has. You bet. Thank you, sir. And how about you, CNO? Execution, as uh, Vern Clark well, uh, always used to tell yeah, us. Yeah, the most important part of it, I suppose. Uh, we're, it codifies, uh, I believe, what we're doing in the Navy, especially the, the organizing, training, equipment, and the deployment. So what we've done is sort of captured what we're doing out there. However, uh, you gotta, I want it to be, it has to be uh, consumed and digested internally, externally, mm -hmm. especially with partners and allies, and, yeah. and to that extent, we have, uh, we have it being translated in several languages, mm -hmm. and we'll send it out to our, in fact, it's in progress as we Terrific. speak today to get out there about, I need to listen to them and say, so what does this mean to you? <laughs> because partnership is a huge part of this, and so right. they're a obviously a major player, or they're not a partner. Right. Uh, we need, to, I will look at the building of the next POM uh, through the lens of how this is laid out. It's not designed to build a budget right on top of it. There's a layer in between, but it defines that fairly well on our endeavors in that regard. And then lastly, I would say uh, there's a classified annex or two or three to be put together here. Sure to go to the next level and say, okay, how do we, do, and probably regionally, mm -hmm. so how do we deal with this regionally mm -hmm. in more detail at a higher classification? Yeah. Well, I, I think even in the title, uh, cooperative strategy, I think there's an international component, as CNO indicates, an interagency <coughs> cooperative component, and hopefully over time a private-public one, which I think Commandant of the Coast Guard uh, yeah. mentioned the Arctic and, and a number of ways to pull all that together. And I'm glad you mentioned CNO, the strategic communications piece of this. What's more important than using this as a lever to tell the story? So right. with that, let me open it up for uh, questions and comments. And please uh, say a word. Hello, Kevin Wensing. Please uh, indicate who you would like to address the question to or to all three. If, uh, and I'll, we'll look for fairly crisp answers so we can get a lot of people in. Captain Wentz. Okay, well, thanks, Admiral. Uh, in today's Washington Post, there was an opinion piece by someone named Jim Stavridis uh, about the soft <laughs> underbelly of uh, Europe. So I'd like to have all three of the panelists maybe look at what we can do to help uh, the underbelly of Europe, the Italians in particular, protect against ISIS and other terrorist organizations. Uh, I'll go first. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, one of the a good point Jim made right off the bat is maritime domain awareness. Uh, and Jim made it clear, this is a collective effort that needs to take place out there. We have an ocean shield effort. Uh, we have a, a Operation Atalanta, uh, both NATO, both uh, a little bit, in my opinion, legacy that can be reapplied for that area. So I think sharing as much information as possible to help the Italians in this would be a great first step. And perhaps the least effort needed. Mm -hmm. And Commandant, you know the uh, Italian Coast Guard is deeply involved in this effort across that strait, which has humanitarian aspects. Mm -hmm. Are we working with them, cooperating with the Italians in particular, or in a general sense? We have a uh, North Atlantic Coast Guard form, and they had 170,000 migrants mm -hmm. you know, leave the north coast of Africa, and then they arrive in Italy, some from Syria. There's very little biometrics, uh, but there's also very little unity of effort within the European Union. Uh, so whoever takes receipt is now the owner. Uh, and so we want to make sure that there's a clear end game as, as you deal with a mass migration is what is the end state. Uh, we certainly have a model that we use here in the United States. Does it apply in the European Union? Right now it doesn't. Uh, so there really needs to be an authorities piece that goes with that. So uh, you don't want to go in, uh, start something that doesn't have a clear end game to it, you know, especially if you don't have the authorities. Uh, but we sure. have that very frank and open sure. dialogue. So Commandant, anything you'd like to add? I think that question gets at what I alluded to earlier, which is in, in, in the European uh, command, we have a gap, in, in frankly, AFRICOM, we have a gap in our ability to do crisis response mm -hmm. from the sea. And we actually expect, uh, CNO and I expect from, uh, from, from both commanders, uh, a letter that will request a, a mobile landing platform, a, a float staging base to help fill that yeah. gap. And so that's one, of the, that's one of the ways that we can help out is, uh, you know, my, the whole first part of my career, 
going to the Med was a routine occasion. We always had strong naval presence uh, in the Mediterranean. We don't have that today uh, as a result of challenges in the Middle East and the presence required in the Pacific. And so UCOM and AFRICOM have been a bill pair, if you will, uh, for our presence in the Middle East and in, in, uh, in, in the Pacific. And I think back to the point of the strategy and causing us to think differently with the resources that we have available, there's a perfect problem that's already working. In other words, we're in a dialogue right now with the combatant commanders. They've articulated the gap in, in crisis response sure. there. Uh, I mentioned one material solution. That's not the limit of the material yeah. solution. But the point is trying to figure out how do we get Marines and sailors back into the Mediterranean to support uh, what you wrote about this morning in the southern flank of Europe, because there are obviously very real security challenges, and Ford presence is a key piece of, of addressing those. Yeah, and I, I agree in particular. I want to underline this a float forward staging base, because it's also an, an opportunity for private-public partnering. It's a creative idea. I've seen it bouncing around. Uh, Sir. I would say that within the strategy, we talk about a global network. Mm -hmm. And uh, at any given day, we took a muster one time. There are about six to 700 ships underway within what we would call the freedom-loving nations mm -hmm. around the world. Mm -hmm. So if you take the full inventory, it's well over 1,000 ships. So we of have 1,000 ship Navy you potential bet. energy out there. So my point would be, these are the kind of opportunities, a kind of a common problem. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants this to happen, right? right? right. And, and here's a, an ally, a friend, that we could get together. How hard can this be? And we have the ships. Great so point. bring it together, get the common network, and go to work. That's kind of the point. Great point. Thank you. How about over here, sir? Sydney Friedberg, Breaking Defense. Uh, a question first for the, for the CNO, but I think both commandants can probably add to it as well. You know, the one thing of this that seems new in sort of doctrinal terms is you have these four traditional functions. You've added all domain access, which is admittedly a very vague term, uh, but intriguing, uh, as a fifth. It's a long list of things, but A, what's the unifying idea of all domain access? It seems to imply a somewhat scarier world we have to fight for access. Uh, and what does it mean institutionally in terms of how the three services actually allocate resources and train people uh, for it to be elevated to a fifth core function. You, you have to think about, it's, it's all well and good to want to project power, be deterrent, and all of these things. If you can't get to where you need to get, which could be on the surface, under the sea, in the space, you get my point, all of the domains, including cyber, you'll be ineffective. In the world, that we live in with the means that we are being tasked to project power and do the things that our military is, is required to do. It's, it's, it's more conceptual, Sydney, in our approach, and it captures the very essence, in my opinion, of what started out to be the ARC battle concept. If you don't have that, and it's not a, a primary function that all of our kids are thinking about when they develop, when they organize, train, and equip, and operate, we won't be uh, we will not necessarily be successful. That's the that's what that meant. Yeah, I think for Marines, it really codifies the way we think. Anyway, we've never associated ourselves with a specific domain. We've always thought of ourselves as having a lane within both the sea, air, and uh, sea, air, and and, uh, and land domain. Uh, and what this really is, I think, is another way of looking at combined arms integration. Uh, but now it's both traditional and non-traditional combined arms integration to ensure that we can do whatever we want to do whenever we want to do it. And I think that's an important piece of there is an offensive war fighting tone uh, to this document that, that says where the United States has interests and needs access, it can have that access. And, uh, and I think that's what that, that's what that concept captures. Thanks. Um, how about someone here in the center? Right here, sir. Thank you, Admiral. Hank Hendrickson with the U.S. Philippine Society. Uh, to turn toward Asia, if I may, sure. uh, just be curious about uh, to know how you see evolving relations with the Philippines in light of what's going on in terms of both the rebalance to Asia and in the South China Sea. Thank you. Terrific. Um, please, Commandant, you want to start us off? No, I, I'm, I, I'm actually uh, encouraged, and you probably are tracking it pretty closely. I mean, our, our our relationship with the Philippines, particularly in the last two or three years, the military-to-military -military engagement has really improved 
uh, quite a bit. And, uh, and, and I can foresee now uh, operationalizing some of the ideas that we're, uh, that we're discussing uh, with the Philippine military. You've seen more Marines in and out of the Philippines lately than we have uh, for a few years. Uh, we provided good support to the Philippines in dealing with their own insurgency. Uh, and so, you know, I think um, consistent with the overall rebalance to the Pacific and consistent with developing strong partnerships and relationships, Philippines have, Filipinos have been uh, strong partners for many years. We had a little bit of a dip uh, in the relationship, but I think uh, but that there's a, uh, there's a compelling reason for us uh, to cooperate more closely uh, in the future than we have perhaps over the last few years. Commandant, I know your uh, three-star command was the Pacific for the Coast Guard. Would it was, like and yeah, we do a lot of work with the Philippines. Two of our, our former Hamilton-class cutters are now painted gray, and they're, they're in the Philippine Navy. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we have very frequent dialogues. We have Philippine cadets uh, at our academy that when they graduate, we've had several rise to be chiefs of their respective services. Uh, and so it, it's a strategic relationship. But then you've got places like Mischief Reef. 120 miles off the coast of Palawan uh, that, that the Philippines can't access. Uh, and then what is the role of ASEAN? So not just the Philippines, Vietnam and others that have been more vociferous over the nine dotted line and what they clearly see as encroachment on their territorial and their economic exclusive zone in this case. Uh, the real challenge for us is what is the role of the United States? Right now our policy is one of non-intervention. Uh, and We would like to see this resolve amicably uh, without any miscalculation. Um, but how long does this go on? And at what point, what instrument might you use for U.S. diplomacy? And maybe it's a white ship with a Coast Guard stripe on it. Maybe not a gray ship. But all of those conversations uh, we continue to have in a, a very open, transparent dialogue with the Philippines. Well, let me ask a former 7th Fleet commander uh, who knows the Pacific as well as anybody, what are your thoughts, CNO? I, I, we need to move, well, first of all, there's a, de, a defined treaty. So we have treaty obligations with the Philippines and one of the five in the Western Pacific that we have. But then when well, you go beyond that, you say, what, what do they want to do? What are their aspirations? And how do we make our opportunities resonate with that at a pace that makes sense with them? We have to enable them, as, as my colleagues had mentioned before, we're in the process of doing that. I get back to maritime domain awareness and the willingness of that group, as, as Paul mentioned, to be a network in this whole thing. There's an amazing deterrent mm -hmm. effect, intellectual mm -hmm. deterrent. Mm -hmm. uh, when folks see us all getting together and they're not, mm -hmm. you know, that's uneasy to them because yeah. what does that beget? Yeah. yeah. Well, let me take the uh, moderator's prerogative, and since we're in the Pacific, let me ask each of you to comment on to what degree was China and China's military in your minds as you worked and crafted on this strategy? CNO, you want to start us Oh, off? major part. Yeah. Uh, it, they're in there. Yeah. Uh, we have taken the chance, the opportunity, I should say, to lay in by region and in some cases uh, by nation. They weren't the only one, but they were a large part of it. And I think it's, uh, I hope people would read it and say, yeah, I see that right here. Commandant? This is about projecting U.S. influence in the Pacific, where we have significant political and, and economic interests. And, and for Marines, uh, this was a nat you know, natural piece of the strategy. We, we view our contribution as the 22,500 Marines west of the international date line. I think that sends a clear and unmistakable signal to anyone in the Pacific that there's U.S. commitment in the region. And I think certainly uh, we want that to be part of China's calculus. Good. Commandant? As we talked about earlier about partnerships and relationships, uh, the Coast Guard has a long-standing one with, with China, and uh, they, they're modeling their Coast Guard after the United States mm -hmm. Coast Guard. Four of the five dragons are now China Coast Guard, complete with a paint scheme, racing stripe, uh, not our people, not our authorities, but they're replicating the United States Coast Guard. Uh, each year we do a combined operation. It's not an exercise. It goes on for about two months. Uh, where we share information, we put Chinese ship riders on Coast Guard cutters, and then we direct intercept operations. And then China is signatory to the UN Convention on High Sea Drift Net Fishing, and so we seize vessels and we hand them over to China for prosecution. Uh, so it's a good news story that we have with China. Uh, and this month I will host the director of the Maritime Safety Administration, which is not a member of the China Coast Guard, but they have the greatest presence out in the East and South China Sea to address the issues of cues, as the CNO has brought up, to socialize that aspect so we don't have miscalculations between China and the United States. Got it. Thank you. Um, Senator Warner, Secretary of the Navy Warner. Thank you very 
Thank you very much. Yes, sir, just one moment for the microphone. You have opened with a reference to the Cold War, and I remember it quite well. And at that time, <laughs> at that time, we had off the coast of the United States Soviet submarines with a full load, not more than four or 500 miles off our coast, patrolling. And every morning in the Pentagon, when we started the day, we were briefed on the positions and what our collective ASW capabilities were and the status. And my question, with all due respect to you, Admiral, uh, you've devoted your life to the silent service. And our triad, land, sea, and air, of that team, the survivability of the submarine force is the highest. To the extent you can share with us today, the cutting edge that we had in the late 60s and 70s kept that Cold War from becoming a hot oil. Do we have that cutting edge <clears throat> technology today in our combined ASW forces, given the advancements of today's Russia in the submarine business. And the last question is that uh, they had a, an interesting military general staff. And uh, there was a strong link of communications between our military and Admiral Gorskov, and Gretschko, and uh, those chains were kept open. Now, given the mysteries surrounding Putin today, are those communications still there? And do we have that cutting edge as a deterrent from letting this current situation get hot? Uh, thanks, Senator. Uh, and thanks for all the things that you do. We're, we very much look forward to delivering the John Warner in the not too distant future. <laughs> just a plug. I'm just saying. Speaking of the silent service. <laughs> Uh, I, I summarize it by saying we own the undersea domain today. I am very comfortable with where we are today. I am very uncomfortable with where we're headed when I look at the budgetary situation. And I don't want to turn this necessarily into a budget question, but we have the advantage in the undersea today. We will not enjoy that advantage if we head down the budget world that, that ends with the Budget Control Act levels of funding because we just aren't keeping up with the movement of technology today. So with that said, uh, we have it intellectually, we have it in the culture, and we have it in the technology. And I'm talking not just the submarines, I'm talking about the network of systems under the water and the new P-8 aircraft, which is a quantum leap in our anti-submarine warfare capability. Uh, Senator, the, uh, just a few years ago, in my tingy house there in the dining room, you know, I was drinking a vodka toast with, uh, with the chief of the Russian Navy, uh, Viktor Cherkov. And he was talking about how I'm headed to St. Petersburg, and I was so excited. And just like that, months later, no communication. And so we are frankly cut off. I worry about it very much so. Because I've seen the opportunities, that, and you have too, sir, in the Cold War that present themselves when you can have engagement as we've been able to have with China and some of the movement we've had spoken to in this room about what we've been able to do. But we have no engagement with uh, Russia right now and no engagement with Iran, which bothers me. And I think if we could work to that regard, it would behest us uh, overall in the, uh, for our security situation. Thanks. Uh, how about someone right here? Jack. Thank you, and good morning. <clears throat> Jack London. <clears throat> in the creation of any uh, strategy, one always thinks in terms of uh, threats and challenges and vulnerabilities. And following on uh, Senator Warner's uh, question and others, maybe you could focus for a moment on what are the higher priority thro threat profiles for which this strategy has been created to give us some perspective. Mm. Want to start here in the center, Commandant? Sure. Uh, I think what it outlines at first, obviously, uh, violent extremism is, uh, is one of the threats that's outlined. Uh, certainly Russia and the developments that we just alluded to uh, is part of it. Uh, earlier question was China. You'd have to think about North Korea, nuclear weapons, ballistic missiles. Uh, those are probably some of the top challenges that the, that the strategy outlines and addresses. 
Commandant? Uh, for me, it's the role of non-state actors in the maritime domain. When I look at organized crime, it's a $750 billion enterprise. And what's the second order effect of that? Rule of law, good governance, regional stability. And where are they most vulnerable? They're most vulnerable at sea. Uh, so the Coast Guard has 41 treaties with other countries to be their law enforcement arm, also using military authorities right into their territorial sea, which is unique. There's no other set of authorities like it on the world. So for us, it provides us that, that emphasis, if you will, on non-state actors and their role with regard to regional stability. And CNO? Uh, nation state, I'd say uh, North Korea, Iran, uh, Russia, and, uh, and the non-state actors stated by my colleagues from Boko Haram to you know, ISIS to Al-Qaeda, IM, AP. Uh, Subject-wise, uh, cyber. Uh, yeah, I think uh, we, we have to grasp what it really means and what we have to do in the mechanics of that. There's a host of weapons I won't bore people with that we're working on. Yeah. Connor. No, I, I completely agree on cyber. Um, in my time as the NATO commander, that kept me more awake than Afghanistan, Libya, the Balkans, mm -hmm. and a number of other challenges. Others, sir, right here. Thank you very much. Don't we wish China Review News Agency of Hong Kong. I have a follow-up question of uh, US-China military uh, relations. My question is particularly for Admiral Greener. Um, we know uh, a couple of weeks ago, the two warships of the US Navy and PLA Navy for the first time conducted the uh, COC of the unexpected uh, encounter in the South China Sea. So how significant it is? And what kind of uh, military exchange programs uh, will be going on in this year between the US Navy and PLA Navy? Thank you. Uh, this year, 2015? Yes. yes. Uh, not a lot. Not as much as I would hope. There are no, there's no big multi, uh, multilateral exercise this year. We look ahead to RIMPAC 2016 toward that uh, and see where that goes. But we, we have occasional bilaterals. We do them in the Gulf of Aden uh, with uh, PLAN ships. Uh, Admiral Wu Sheng Li and I would very much like to, and we are in the progress of getting what we call modules. Simple exercises so that when our two ships pass in the East China Sea, South China Sea, wherever, uh, our sea, those commanding officers have the authority vested in them to say, hey, let's do common book, and you call it out. We, we do it with NATO ships all the time. I think it was called ATP-1 Alpha. It used to be the old it. book. But, yeah, usually you're laughing. You know how old you are, right? <laughs> so so you can, we can do this. Uh, there are others. There are some um, some multilateral exercises in the uh, South China, uh, I should say the ASEAN area that we work. Brunei hosted some, and there are others in the mix. Uh, but I, th I think that basically we are looking for those opportunities, uh, tactical opportunities as well as broader multilateral. I think you'll find 2016 will be a, a, a better year than 15. It's, it tends to go in cycles. Let me get someone from over here. How about uh, all the way in the back? Can we get a mic to this gentleman? Where is our mic person? Oh, here. Ah, there we go. Great. Sure. Good morning. My name is Colin Steele. I work at Georgetown University. And I'd first like to thank all the panelists and then ask all of them about evolving cooperative strategies between the sea services as we transition out of land-based warfare, particularly with respect to non-state or even non-war operations. Transitioning out of land warfare. Yeah. I think we're probably going to continue to do some land warfare, but uh, cooperative yeah. strategies, please, between the services. Anything in particular that jumps to your mind, Commandant? Well, it, first, before the strategy, maybe just the process. You know, one, one thing we revived a couple of years ago was the Naval Board, and that's got both the senior leadership in the Marine Corps and, and CNO senior leadership in the Naval Board. And that board really is designed uh, to, to drive better integration between the Navy and the Marine Corps, both for day-to-day -day operations, but as well uh, on, on, on initiatives like the cooperative strategy. Where are we going in the future? What's going to be the capability development we need to have the Navy and Marine Corps that we want to have in 2020, 2022? And, and I would just say, I, I think the comment you made is, is probably captures my sentiment. You know, land warfare is not going away. And the Marine Corps never left, from, left, never left the sea. 
So there's, there's an overstatement on both sides. It, we, throughout the last uh, 14 years of, of land warfare, if you will, uh, we've remained at sea. Our Marine Expeditionary okay. Units have continued to be out there. It's been an issue of capacity, uh, number one, and it's also been an issue of level of warfare. We probably have, uh, where we've suffered the most is not in our day-to-day -day forward deployed crisis response capability. The, the ARG mu capabilities are still what they need to be. I think it's probably in the high-end war fighting where it's suffered a little bit because we haven't had the opportunity to conduct the kind of exercises and training necessary to do that. And, uh, and I think that's where really our focus is right now. But, but I would tell you, I think the, the Naval Board, uh, which has historically been something that's brought the Navy and Marine Corps together, revitalizing that uh, under Admiral Greener's leadership a couple of years ago with my predecessor, uh, I'm certainly committed to that. We'll continue to do that. And I think that's the right vehicle to get to where we need to be. Commandant, um uh, in my strike group, we deployed with a Coast Guard cutter. Is that kind of integration still in progress occasionally? Uh, very, very much. Uh, we, we meet, and we've been meeting probably for over two decades now on an annual basis. CNO, Common Island Coast Guard, and, and our very senior staffs, uh, NAV Guard Board is mm -hmm. what it used to be called. Uh, so we look at regions of the world. We looked at the Arctic, uh, and we said, what is the greatest risk in the Arctic right now? And it really speaks to a Coast Guard-like equities as a Navy, Navy developed a, a road ahead for the Arctic region. Uh, we have Coast Guard law enforcement teams fully integrated doing Oceania maritime security initiatives as we look at threatened EEZs in that part of the world. Uh, no different in Africa as well. So whether it's law enforcement teams or fully integration with, uh, with our Navy counterparts. Uh, our newest national security cutter was the SAG commander for the PLA during this last RIMPAC. It was a good fit for us. Uh, and so wherever we can support, but we've had, it's been in our DNA for probably well over, well, probably sure. since 1790, quite yeah. honestly. Sure. Mm. CNO, anything to add on that? Well, I'd say that as a, uh, the U.S. Navy is a very much a supporting entity when it comes to, you know, warfare ashore. So our job is to be out and about where it matters, when it matters, as I like to say. If something erupts, put it out, put that fire out right away using my, with my two colleagues as partnership. If that doesn't get it done and we gotta go to war at sea, we establish maritime superiority, which means you can go where you need to go with acceptable risk and prevent another country or an adversary from doing the same. Then establish a sea base and support land operations with either the Marine Corps or the Army, as the case may be, the Air Force and Air Power. I mean, I'm not trying to wrap it up in some perfect thing, but all I would suggest is uh, it isn't that clear cut, as my colleagues have said. We're still intertwined in this land warfare piece yeah. and a major supporting entity. Yeah. Supporting, I emphasize. Thanks. Uh, how about somebody over here? Yes, ma'am, right over here. Hi, Megan Eckstein with USNI News. Um, Admiral Greener, you mentioned earlier uh, that you were going to be looking at the next POM cycle through the lens of this strategy. So I wonder for all three of you if there are any areas that you see now where the FY16 budget may not mesh up perfectly with this strategy and where you may need to kind of tweak your budget. Yeah, I'll start off yeah, with... Go uh, right down the line. Uh, the, with strategic deterrence. Uh, the the sea-based strategic deterrent is our number one mission that we provide uh, the security of the United States. That's homeland security. We have to replace the current Ohio-class submarine. Senator Warner kind of alluded to it earlier, the survival piece. Uh, we don't have the money associated to do that without ruining the shipbuilding account, which uh, permeates all that this strategy is about for the future. Uh, that is my number one conundrum right now. I, I think probably one of the one of the key areas that's that's not properly aligned and we've got to work on is, is command and control as as a whole. This this implies uh, distributed operations uh, to a good degree, probably greater than we've been doing historically. Uh, it's a trend that's happened. We used to we used to talk a lot about split amphibious ready group marine expeditionary unit operations within the same within the same COCOM. And we used to argue as to whether or not that ought to be a good thing to do or not, and whether we, whether we ought to train, organize, and equip to actually be able to do split ARG operations. It's now the routine. It's always going to happen. 
And not only that, we now have what we call disaggregated operations, which means routinely we're going to have naval forces that are operating simultaneously in two separate combatant commanders' area responsibility. And, and I'm not satisfied that we've actually addressed the organizational implications, the equipment implications, and the training implications to fully realize the distributed operations that are, that are captured inside the document. And that's, that's actually a huge focus for us. It isn't so much about POM 16, to be honest with you, because it's not just going out and buying things. It's actually thinking our way through this and making sure that what we're doing is fully integrated and, and develops the capability. So it's just not about going buying more radios, which I could do that in 16. It's about us coming together and identifying the capability that we need to have and making sure that's properly resourced. And I'll finish just by saying that there's two questions I asked my team the other day as we did the POM 17 review. The first question was, does this fully support uh, distributed operations at the company level, which for us is one of the concepts. The second question was, does this fully support operational maneuver from the sea, and do we actually realize then in the context of CS21 what we're saying we need to be able to do? So it's, it, this is really not just you know FY16 or POM16. This is about capability development over the next three, five, frankly, seven or eight years. Commandant, you're, of course, in a different department. Um, I assume Secretary Jay Johnson has had a good look at this strategy. And how about you? How would you answer the question in terms of the needs and supporting the cooperative strategy that's laid out here? First, with the respect to the Department of Homeland Security, tremendous, tremendous support from, from my secretary, uh, because we're on the threshold of what will be the largest recapitalization effort in Coast Guard history. Uh, we have three bids that are out. We will down select next year, and then we need to move ahead on recapitalizing a fleet of ships that today is 50 years old. And in, when that first ship is delivered, there'll be 55. And so I explain to people that are not familiar with the maritime domain, when you get to the sea buoy and then you go beyond that, I always say it gets very lonely. It gets lonely because we are the only entity in the world that has three sets of authorities, 61 bilateral agreements that, that cover counter drugs, fisheries, but even more importantly, weapons of mass destruction on every flag state of convenience. So if you have a shipment destined for the United States, do you want a goal line defense inside the sea buoy, or do you want the ability to exert U.S. sovereignty into the territorial seas of where that ship departed? And the answer is, I'd much rather have the latter. Uh, but we're not going to have that as a nation if we don't make this investment to build affordable ships, but most importantly, with the authorities vested in the United States Coast Guard to be able to exert our sovereignty well beyond the sea buoy. Thank you. Uh, Ray Dubois, right here from CSIS. Thank you, Jim. Your strategy in Section 4 addresses building the future force, and obviously all strategies to be compelling and to be strong must address the issue of people. With respect to the advances in science and advances in technologies, how are the sea services addressing incorporating those advances into the professional military education issues, war college curricula, to assist our our future leaders in appreciating those, uh, those technologies and how they impact our strategy and how they might enhance our ability to think strategically. And can I just ask, as you answer that, incorporate cyber into it specifically? And I know CNO, you're doing some exciting things at the academy mm -hmm. uh, with cyber along those lines. Sure. sure. You want me to start? Please. Well, let me start with the academy then. Uh, we have a, a cyber, some call it a cyber center. I think we need to rename it. I've asked that. It's an information dominant center because it's more than cyber in the essence, but I think it, it connotates the, the point. Uh, what does that mean? That, well, we need some very basic training here. The midshipmen must uh, have embedded in them, inculcated in them an understanding of what all this means, including the protection, simple cyber hygiene, yeah. which remains. 70% of the problems Correct. we have, Correct. you know, somebody is fishing and you bring in, yep. you know, you get sucked in and boy, you've, yep. you've uh, infected it. So uh, uh, to Ray's point, uh, we have to get to the point where we uh, entice people into that technological piece. We have very smart people coming in the Navy, but as Bill Moran is working with, we need to manage our talent uh, requisite to today's folks. What does that mean? Uh, we come in and we're in, sort of in a conga line. What year group are you in? In whatever amount of years, you will make JG, lieutenant, and whatever. It doesn't really matter how talented you are for a while. 
And then at some point, you might get deep selective. We don't have as many of those as we used to. Why is that? And then we'll say, I'll tell you what, you're so smart, we're going to send you away to school, maybe Oxford. And when you come back, uh, you're two years behind your year group. How'd that happen? And now it's time for you to go before a board. He didn't select. She didn't select. Uh-huh. It happens. And so they're saying, well, why do I want to be in that unit? So we've got to work our way out of the year group mentality, get some flexibility into that, uh, allow them to, to blossom off and take maybe some time to go off and do other things somewhere else in that career. We call it career intermission. It's a pilot now. We need it to be a program. So we're, we're taking the hill on, and we're getting some reasonably good support. <coughs> we need a bill with it in there. Uh, we need many more females in the Navy than we have. Look at society. We don't represent it. Where, where's the intelligence out there? A lot of it is in the female population graduating from college. We need to mine it, bring it in, and allow them to be able to feel that they can do this career, still have a family, and do whatever else they need to do. So lastly, how do you, uh, how do you get to them and understand the science and technology of it? STEM. To, to get people out there to infuse that into the 10, 11, and 12-year-olds so that they have that kind of interest in that. Uh, I'll leave it with last thing. I, I was like stunned and amazed. I met somebody the other day, a guy who introduced me to his son. And I said, so what are you doing? And he said, man, I'm in STEM. And I almost fell. I wanted to hug the kid. That would have been too <laughs> freaky on him. It's out there, and it's starting to work. And he was interested in the Navy as a result of STEM. So anyway, uh, just a few thoughts here. Thanks. Commandant. You asked a question about institutionalizing the curriculum in, in our education. I, I'm satisfied with that piece, but I, I've got a different problem. Uh, some of you probably don't know this. I mean, 60 percent of the United States Marine Corps is on their first enlistment, and 40 percent of the United States Marine Corps is in the bottom three enlisted grades. And so as we look at the challenges that we're, that we're speaking about, as we look at the requirement for cyber capabilities, as we look at F-35 mechanics, as we look at some of the more technical occupational fields, and as we look at the challenges, frankly, on our small unit leaders to be able to integrate all that, even at the sergeant squad leader level. You know, as, as an example, we've, our frontline leadership has typically been uh, three to four year sergeants. And today, if you compare the challenges, without taking too much time and answering the question, if you compare the challenges on that frontline uh, squad leader in charge of 13 Marines today to what it was when I first came into Marine Corps, there's no comparison. So one of the things that we just did, actually, I released a message last week where we're moving uh, that frontline leadership from a three to four year sergeant to a five to six year sergeant so we can better integrate what I call maturity, which is experience, education, and training. And we're now remapping, frankly, all of our occupational fields, all our enlisted fields. In fact, where I'm going immediately after this is down to our manpower uh, section to talk to all of our folks down there about this problem because we're going to do what we call mature the force. And so at the end of the day, I'm hesitant to give you a percentage, but I will tell you that the composition of the force uh, in the coming years will be much different than it is today. And that 60% first term is that number is going to draw, that number is going to be reduced. In the numbers of lance corporals we have relative to the numbers of sergeants, staff sergeants, and gunnery sergeants that we have is going to change. And part of that is because, you know, the, uh, the skill sets that you need and the time you need to integrate, again, education, how to think, training what to do, and then experience, the, the time that you need to integrate those three components into what I call professional maturity is just much greater than it has been in the past. And so the demographics of the force are going to change so that we can take advantage of the curriculum changes in the education pieces, which I think are much easier to do. It's much easier to put that in there than it is to have human capital strategies that, are, that support that. Commandant, from the Coast Guard perspective? Flip the Marine Corps the other way, and the nucleus of my service is in that 8 to 15 year range. And we're bringing in some of the, the brightest talent that this nation can bring to bear. From time to time, I sponsor a recruit company. The last one I sponsored, 30% had bachelor's degrees, 15% had master's degrees, one had a PhD as an E2 in the United States Coast Guard. Our retention rate over the last four years, 93%. So as I look at who's my competition, it's the private sector. And, and they are cherry picking the best talent that I have. And, and I've got tremendous talent. You know, we are now specializing in the Coast Guard in cyber and in intelligence acquisitions. As we're bringing more complex systems, we're not bringing on the F 35. I want to go on the record on that. Uh, but <laughs> you're the only one. Making news. Uh, get with it. We, we, are, we are bringing the F 35 online. I want to go on the record on that. Also making news. <laughs> 
but, but our ships, our sensors, much more complex. And so our technicians that maintain those systems, when they leave that platform, they need to go to a shore installation that's going to maintain it. When it's time for them to go back to sea again, that's exactly where they need to go. So we need to put better circuit discipline into our human resource capital plan, which includes education, uh, which includes staying in a chosen field long enough so you really become masters of that pro chosen profession. And the good news is we have people that have a passion for each and every one of these. Uh, and I just need to make sure that I hold on to them. Wonderful. And I think uh, a terrific place to close an extraordinary event uh, with our people. We all know that's really the future. Yeah. Let, me, uh, let me also thank uh, the U.S. <clears throat> Naval Institute, uh, but particularly CSIS for hosting this, and Lockheed Martin, speaking of private-public cooperation, who has helped put this event together today. Lastly, uh, before concluding with a round of applause for the service chiefs, I want to just say I suspect there are a lot of people in the room today who work on this strategy. A lot of 03s and 04s and 05s and some brilliant 06s in each of the services who were like Cain and Abel working every sentence and every line. Um, if you worked on this strategy, could you just raise your hand? You worked on this strategy in some way? Yeah. Thank you. Well done. So I'll conclude by saying that we should feel wonderful as a nation and as citizens to look at these three officers who lead the sea services of the United States of America. Well done, gentlemen. Thank you. Thanks, Jim.